to Enlightenment of Change on webtalkradio.com. I'm your host, Connie Whitman. Thank you so much for joining us this week. So just a couple of things, a little housekeeping. Change is hard. Look, my guests and I, we get it, especially if the, tr- the, the change is thrust upon you and you haven't chosen it. So to help you on your journey of change, in my show notes, you will see I have a gift for you. It's my communication style assessment. Two reports. One will spotlight your natural superpowers, just how people are receiving your message. Very important to know and understand. Flip side, your lowest score, you'll get a report on that as well. For me, I think that's even more impactful because their potential where the blind spots sit. And when you're speaking with people who are opposite of you, you, your message might, might not be landing the way you had hoped. Additionally, if you're loving me, you're loving the show, please come and play with us. I have an all-star community. That link is in the show notes. You could get more information, but I'd love for you to come and play. Now, my quote for today to set the stage for my guests and my conversation is by Carrie Wilkerson. And Carrie says, the longer you're not taking action, the more money you're losing. And what hit me with this quote is that action is a really good thing as long as hopefully we're taking the correct action. So for example, I always see this where business owners don't pay themselves first, as if the the scraps of money left over should be enough for them. So how do we change this mindset, right? Change again of getting what's left over to paying ourselves first so we can thrive inside as well as outside of our business. Now, of course, my guest today is an expert, Jane, Jeff, Jennifer Sapel. Jen, uh, Jen, I was going to say Jen first, but I wanted to say her full name. So Jennifer Sapel. Jen is a recovering overachiever who overcompensated financially li- after living with a mother who struggled financially after the divorce. Her strive to succeed, curiosity, and astonishing ability to problem solve helped propel her success in financial services, winning awards, and often being the only woman leader in the room. Um, She started Utor uh, Wealth after after tiring of long-winded meetings and and overemphasis on products and sales quotas. Utor is Latin for, for, oh my gosh, Jen, I can't talk today. Uter is Latin for to use, to employ, to enjoy. I love that. And Jen believes that every dollar we touch and how we send it out into the world shapes our lives and the ones we aspire to. So please help me welcome Jen to the show. I am loving this topic. And again, how did you land on that name, Utor? Um, <clears throat> it was pre-pandemic. So I think, you know, like everything, everything's changed <laughs> through the pandemic. So pre-pandemic, when I left the big corporate gig to launch Utor, um, I was like, we need to change our relationship with money. Like it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a stodgy, scary, uh, any of those kinds of things topic. It needs to be something that like, hey, this is fuel for you to be able to live a life that you enjoy. Like that's what money is. So, and how you define joy and what you enjoy can look very different from everybody else. Um, So that's how we arrived at the name. I love it. I think it's cool. So yeah, you know, it's, it's what, like when I, I remember when I started my business 22 years ago, Jen, and I went to the local community college, learned about what an LLC is, a C-corp, right? Trying to get my, I was still working, but I was trying to get my sea legs as to what this business thing, because I knew I wanted to open a business someday. And the guy said to me, oh, okay, we can process the paperwork. What name? <laughs> uh, Whitman and Associates? I, right. I, I, I had not that. I was thinking about learning all the technical never dawned on me that I actually had to pick a name. Isn't that funny? So I, <laughs> yours had was thought provoking and I love it. So that was a good, good story and a good way to start. Yeah. And it is, it is a good story. I'm, you know, I'm considering rebranding. I thought it was great at the time. I love that. I have to explain what it means. Right. Cause nobody comes to me and is like, Oh yeah. What does that mean? Or how do you pronounce it? Um, and there's pros and cons to naming conventions, right? Because nobody's going to search Utor. <laughs> but it's Utor wealth and it's Utor wealth so we know you do money <laughs> yeah <laughs> right you did put the word wealth in there so yeah, I, I got the wealth okay. in there yeah so I don't know right. if I can do that again I would probably consult with a branding expert uh <laughs> before I did that again but it's still fun 
uh, topic of conversation. Yes, and I still give you an A plus to my very D minus with naming of naming <laughs> it, so you still get an A plus. From my yeah, right. yeah, and a good um, lesson, right? Like we 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 both learned something through the process. And and here's the thing. It's okay, right? I'm still functioning and you're still functioning. The name doesn't really matter because people meet us and then execute based on what we can deliver and how we can help them. All right, so you grew up in the financial service industry like me. Yes, many times the only woman in the room. You describe the financial service industry, and I love this, like a bad pair of jeans, ill-fitting and uncomfortable. Great visual. Why? (laughs) Why do you feel that way? Uh, because financial services is an industry that is very, very predominantly one demographic. And so I think that that demographic fits. Those are genes that fit that demographic. Um, but those genes don't fit every demographic. So particularly for women, um, when they, when I come and talk to them, they usually have either met with or worked with a financial advisor in the past. And Mm -hmm it wasn't a pleasant experience for them. It was like ill-fitting jeans for them. (laughs) Which money's important. And to me, growing up in that industry too, that's not okay. And I remember I had another woman on my show, her husband, uh, she had a kid, two kids at home, maybe teenage years, husband passes away suddenly, um, had life insurance, but she still had a mortgage and she wasn't working. She was a stay at home mom. So talk about change thrust upon you. Right. And she went and took this money and said like, this is all I have. I have to find a job now, but I want to make sure I protect this and make it last as long as I possibly can. Cause she didn't know what the job market was going to be. Cause she was a stay at home mom. Well, fast forward, she went to, I think it was like six or seven different financial advisors And literally one of them almost said to her, look, little lady, because she said, well, do I get statements? Will you educate me? Because remember, the husband took care of everything. And this was his response. Like, little lady, that's what you hire me for. I take care of that for you. What an appalling answer. I don't care whether you're a man or a woman, you should understand money. And if somebody ever says that to you, run like hell the other way, because that is not okay. If a financial advisor is doing good by you, they are educating you. They're talking to you constantly to make sure you're not fearful of what's happening in the market and all of those other things. I so, 100%. Yeah. 100%. What a great analogy. And yeah. think about, and like, take that out of the context of financial services. Like, what if she needed a medical procedure and she was, you know, interviewing surgeons and, and if, if when she was asking questions, the surgeon was like, little lady, that's why you're coming to me, you know, is to let me do that. I'm like, no, if you can't answer my question in a way that makes me confident and comfortable in your recommendation, there's no way, <laughs> there's no way I'm trusting you to cut open my body. There's no way I'm trusting you to manage money in an account that has my name on it. That's right. That's right. Totally agree. Yeah. And and, and and self-care. I think we need to put it in like the life skill and self-care, you know, kind of camps in terms of the way we think about it. And just like learning, I I use the analogy of how to use a spoon or a fork. Like I have a three and a five-year-old, right? And when you have kids, you're reminded of how much we have to learn. We have to learn everything as a human. <laughs> everything. Yeah. And we take for granted, like there was a time where none of us knew how to use a spoon. Uh, somebody had to teach us how to use a spoon and then we had to practice doing it so that we got better at it. Same with driving, same with any sport that you have, any kind of skill that you acquire, you start somewhere, you work on it, you develop it. And the more you do that, you get better at it. I would say personal finance is absolutely one of those life skill sets that everybody needs to have. You know, it's interesting. When I started my career 40 years ago, I sold insurance and my sales manager, it was all about the quotas, the numbers. Why didn't you make the sale? It was a beat up, right? Like I wasn't good enough. You're a moron that I literally, literally would call me moron. And I remember the first, maybe probably about a year or two starting in that industry. And I was going for my MBA. I was just finishing my MBA in finance. So I had all of this education and knowledge And I remember I sat with a blue collar family and he was working. She was home with two little girls. And all he kept saying is, but if something happens to me, I don't want her to lose the house. So we need life insurance. But they were just about putting food on the table, Jen. So I said to him, I understand, but here's my fear. 
six months from now, you're going to have spent $500, let's say on this life insurance, and it's going to lapse. So now you've lost $500. You still don't have the insurance. I understand, God forbid something happens, but why don't I teach you about money? We'll get you on a budget that's comfortable and works for you. Then when we can carve out that $50 a month or whatever it is, then we'll open the account. But now you're putting food on the table, you're saving money, plus you have the, the insurance to protect, God forbid, of you know something crazy. Right. So we did that. It took about nine months, right, for him to get comfortable and for me to teach him. I kept going back because we didn't have internet back then. I had to physically go live. And I remember every time I'd come back, my boss would say to me, my manager, what is wrong with you? You're not making money. And I said, but you don't understand. I'm doing the right thing. This person needs help. You know, I'm, I'm blessed to have this education. They're not. Let me help them. Like, stay in your lane. So we're, a lot of fighting went on. Well, fast forward when we opened the life insurance and he was on a budget and they were saving money. Now they had a little nest egg and he was able to pay for the insurance. What do you think he did, Jen? All of his blue collar friends you for everything. Came yeah. for me. Can, you, can, everybody. can yeah. you do what you did for them for me? So now all of a sudden I have all this money coming in and my boss like, what are you doing? I said, it's called referrals because people trust me because I didn't do what you told me to do and go and slam bam. Thank you, ma'am. I went out and I educated my clients so they make informed decisions and now they're in control of their money. So forget about the life insurance. Now he'll be able to put his kids through college if that's what they choose. You know, fast forward, whatever the ripple effect of that financial education. So again, we're so short-sighted to make the sale, but at what cost? And I think that's why, remember I'm 40 years ago, I was the only woman with 43 salespeople, men and me. Um, my whole approach was so different because it's, I still am a woman, right? So you look at things differently than men do. And guys, it's not a put down in any way, Women and men, we think differently. So my softer touch worked for me. Maybe it wouldn't have worked for a dude. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think what we missed, you hit, <clears throat> that's a great story. <laughs> I love it. And having started my financial services career at a life insurance company and my dad saying, if you can sell life insurance, you can sell anything. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I resonate with a lot of that. But you hit on a couple points in there that make women better investors. There's several studies out there that show women outperform in terms of being good investors. Um, and a lot of it comes down to two things that you just mentioned, a short-term mindset and a short-term short -term actions versus long-term approach. Um, and because of that difference, because of the focus on short-term versus long-term, women usually are slower to make the decisions on the front end, but they stick with them over the long haul. And that uh, is an attribution of higher performance over the long haul. And because generally speaking, men are looking for short-term advantages, they're doing more activity inside of their accounts and activity for activity's sake uh, when it comes to investing will also hinder performance. So, um, so the, those attributes, and I, and, and I agree with you, like, it's not a beat up session. I think the thing that we need to acknowledge is that there's a time and a place for short-term thinking and short-term decision-making. Right. And there's a time and a place for long-term thinking and long-term, you know, sustainable decision-making. Both of them are necessary. It's just what, what are we going to apply? Which tools are we going to apply to which situations? And, and you bring another point, see, and us both being, having that sales background, this is important. We customize the solution based on the client in front of me. I didn't, I didn't teach all of my clients about budgeting. That's what that client needed for me before they could buy the insurance. So yeah. sometimes we put the cart before the horse and that's why we get objections. That's why people buy it and then it lapses or they buy it and say, oh, I changed my mind. I want a refund because, because we didn't play the long game. We didn't, we, people have to breathe and understand before yeah. making, especially about money, but we have to educate it appropriately depending on where the person is. So again, I didn't do that with every client but we have to customize. And that's what I think you do with your clients. It's not about oh, female mid, mid uh, fifties. This is what you need. No, because everybody's lifestyle, everybody's situation, everybody's desire of what they're trying to achieve or do in life can be drastically different, right? Down to the car we drive. So I, I think that was um, important. So just one question though, I, that's cool. And I love that statistics are showing because we breathe, kind of percolate, and then make a decision. And then we kind of 
all right, my decision was founded on logic. I'm, an, I'm here for the long game. So I'm happy to hear that women were, were, were educating ourselves to that premise, right, if you will. Why do you think that um, many women avoid talking about money or addressing uh, money? What, like, what's with that? Is, like, we've come a long Shame. way, baby, but. Shame. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, number one on the list is shame. So almost everybody I talk to men or women, especially if they're coming to me, um, they will say, regardless of their financial situation, regardless of how much money they make or how much wealth they have accumulated or invested, they will say something like, I should have done this differently, or I should have done this better or should have whatever. Yeah. So there's an amount of shame and embarrassment about their financial life. Um, and I think that's prob- that's the number one. There's like many, many factors, but I think shame is the is probably the biggest. You know, it's funny when you said that. My husband and I, we talk, I go, you know, we shouldn't have done that or we should have done that when mm-hmm. as it relates. And, you know, I have an MBA in finance. He's a retirement expert. He's in the financial service industry. We made mistakes that is life. That's how we learn and grow. You can't know everything yep. about every situation, especially because the economy, right? Economics affects yep. the decisions we made. And sometimes we have to pivot and shift, right? So there should be no shame with money. Isn't that interesting? And that I think that, I think that there's a lot of confusion with money because, because it's quantifiable, um, you know, because it's, because it is actually a unit of measure, like more than, anything else. It's like a resource of measurement. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is like a real philosophical conversation that we could go down a rabbit hole on, but, but because it's quantifiable, because we can say the account balance is X and this is how it has changed over time. There's this like default setting we have that more is better, less is worse. Um, and more is good and less is bad. Right. Yeah. And you are exactly right. If we put money back into it's a resource and it's a skill set, a hundred percent of us, nobody gets out of living and interacting with money without making mistakes. It's like part of the bag. <laughs> there's, yeah. no, there's no way around it. Uh, and the people who are most comfortable with money, and and again, I would say even the most even the wealthiest people I know, they can tell you they're yes this is a mistake I made. And this is, you know, uh, this is how it was quantified. Uh, It wasn't the end of the world. And, you know, this is what we learned from it, which goes to your, you know, the whole purpose of this podcast is change, right? Change is hard. Like our brains are wired not to change because to our brains, change is scary and threatening and dangerous. Yeah. But the two places that we really get stuck with change most often is that contemplative, like I'm thinking about making a change to the action to like, I'm actually making the change. So that is the first component where people usually get stuck with money Mm -hmm. or otherwise. Mm -hmm. The other place we get stuck is when we make a mistake. So if you're, if you decide I'm going to stick to this budget, you've thought about it for a while, you created the budget and now you're implementing the budget. You got through that first hurdle, right? You're taking the action when you make the mistake, if you blow the budget one month, what do you do when that happens? And too many of us, right? We're just like, oh, like we throw the baby out with the bathwater, like off the wagon, we scrap the whole thing. Yep. You have to build that into your plan. The plan has to be when I make a mistake, I am going to blow this budget. When I blow this budget, this is what I'm going to do next to get back on track and back to the original plan. Which is brilliant because you're making those decisions from a non-emotional perspective and a place of logic. So Mm -hmm. when you do make the mistake and you're like, right, Mm -hmm. that whole emotional brouhaha pops up. Now it's very hard to make a logical decision of what that next logical clear step should be because we're in right instead of that logical perspective. So that is brilliant. When I make a mistake, because you are, you, you the car breaks down, you got to put it on a credit card that you didn't want to do. Like life happens and, yep. and, and you're right. No one escapes it by the way, like bad crap happens to all of us. So, and financially or otherwise. So by having a plan, the other thing too, uh, what you were saying, or my interpretation of what you were saying is create that plan, right? Put it into action and then be fluid because <laughs> that plan might change. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> the plan will change. The plan will change. And I will and I will say even, you know, I've been I've been a financial planner for 20 years. And even the way that I plan and even the way that I plan with my clients has evolved in that 20 years. Yeah, of course. And, and with that body of experience for 20 years, where I'm where I sit today is when I work with clients, I'm like, look, these are the financial principles that we need to be really rigid with, right? Like one financial principle that we need to be really rigid with is that of the income that you earn in a month or in a year, some of that we need to set aside for your future self. Like that is a core principle that we need to stick to. But the method of how we do that can be super flexible, right? So like we need to enjoy some of this money today. We need to put some of this money aside for our future self so that we can enjoy our future sure. self. But the way we do that can be super flexible. You know, you just mentioned the the car, the, the tires blowing off the car. When we plan for emergencies, there's five major risks to personal financial life. But when we plan for contingencies, like, look, these are the five risks. The way that you want to account for those risks in your financial life, the methodology there could be very different. It could be very flexible. But the principle is we do need to account for these risks. So how are we going to account for these risks? And I think that that, again, is one of the barriers for people really seeking good advice and getting good advice is that risk management, you just mentioned life insurance as an example. Life insurance is a risk management measure for what if somebody dies, right? That's right. That's right. It, isn't the only, it isn't the only way to handle that contingency. It's one of the ways, it isn't the only way. And so when you work with an advisor who isn't flexible in their methodology, right? Then every everything, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You're gonna say your solution is the only solution for these things. And I just don't think that's true. <laughs> it, it's, it's personal. Yeah. Finance is personal. We all have different objectives. You know, some people want to have $10 million in the bank. What other people say, you know, if I, if I had a mill, I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't need to live more lavishly than that. And there's no judgment, right? It's personal. It It's funny because, um, you know, when I teach sales and I meet people and I say to them, listen, if, if I'm not resonating with you, I know my process, but I'm going to tell you, I don't give you scripts and temp. I give you uh, structure and say, now let's come up with your questions because it's got to be your voice, your personality. It's got to be everything we build has to be authentically you. You can't sound like me. I don't want you to sound like me because it would be weird, right? So there has to be this level of customization. But the number of people that come to me after they deal with other sales vendors, they say, well, they told me their process works. It worked for them. That doesn't mean it's going to work for you because your personality is different. Your habits are different, right? The structure has to be there, but the way you implement it is going to vary because you're, you're a human. You're different than every other human out there. And it's the same concept that you do. You just do it with money. It's personal. It, our solutions have to be personal because no two people are the same ever, ever with what they're looking to achieve. In anything, yeah. forget about, you know, not just about money, right? Yep. yep. Why do you think, Jen, why do you think, I think more important than ever, is it for us to become just more financially confident and be able to take control of that money? Um, have, have you, do you think it's more important than ever or has it always been and we just have more information hitting us? Like what, what's, what's with that? Yeah, I, I think it has always been, it has always been important. I, I think you can't, the way that we've structured society, you know, the way that our economy works, the way that our social structures work, um, money is the way that we like, the predominant way that we kind of like build the life around us, right? So where we live, what kind of car we drive, what kind of education we get or our kids get, what kind of healthcare we get, what kind of food we eat, like all of those things yeah. are, um, are facilitated through, you know, a currency exchange through money. So we live our best lives. The way that we can like best express ourselves is when we are financially confident. And again, that doesn't mean you live your best life. If you're making a million or $10 million a year, uh, it could mean that you're making $50,000 a year and living your best life. But if you're doing that in an intentional way and a confident way, 
um, you know, our enough number, I, this is, you know, language I use with my clients is there's, there's an enough number. And that number is different for all of us, because again, it depends. What do you want out of this life? Where do you want to live? What kind of place do you want to live in? You want to live in a, a small, do you, are you the kind of person who you never want to be home? Like home is just the place that you sleep and you want to be out and about and you want to be traveling and you want to be doing, you know, other things. Are you the kind of person who loves to be at home? <laughs> That's me, by the way. I want to like be at home. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be cozy and read my book. I want it to be my sanctuary. Um, and like, I don't have to be out and about a lot, right? Those two things would require a different level of income would require, like would require completely different financial structure. So mm -hmm. I think for us to like be as self-actualized as we can yeah. possibly be, um, having financial confidence facilitates that. Do you work with your clients from that mindset beliefs perspective? Because we want, we want to make sure we're using our money to support, right. Our beliefs, to support our values, to support whatever that life that we're trying to create for ourselves, our families, whatever it might be. Do you do a lot? Do you find you need to do a lot with mindset work? Um, I would say it's funny you ask that because I was just on a, a call yesterday with a bunch of coaches and I'm like, I, I would say I do a lot of coaching in my financial advisory practice. Um, but my methodology is we're working through like actual financial action plans. Mm. So yes, you're like implementing the mindset shift by like changing the action. Like in other words, um, somebody comes to me and says like, I, it's important for me to be able to retire at this age or this time. And this is what it looks like. Then I'm like, great, here's, here are the action steps we need to take to make sure that that happens. So like, I do need to understand like, what are you trying to accomplish? What is important to you? But most of the work I'm doing is like holding your hand through each of those steps and like making sure that that stuff actually gets implemented. Yeah, because a plan is great. If we do nothing with the plan, it's just a plan on a piece of paper, right? It's it's no good until we put it into the action. You keep talking about risk factors, right? And like the life insurance can mediate, God forbid somebody dies prematurely, they have little ones at home that the kids could still go to college, pay the mortgage off, right? So the parent doesn't have to sell the house and, and uproot the kids. What are some of the biggest risks that you see or that you know, again, with, with the structure that you've set up um, for the, for those, uh, different individual financial situations? Yeah. Great question. So death, uh, is, is a risk point, yeah. We're all going to die at some point, right? It's an eventuality for all of us. So if, when that happens for you, are other people financially dependent on you, uh, is the question and how are they going to compensate financially it, with the risk of you passing away? So death, death is one yeah. disability is one disability. I would say is probably the most commonly overlooked area yeah. of personal finance, yeah. one in four of us, one in four will suffer a long-term disability, meaning you'll be sick or injured and unable to work for 90 days or longer. Um, and I've seen this with like autoimmune disorders. I've seen it with, um, you know, I've had physician clients um, diagnosed with ALS, you know, things like that. Um, I've seen it with cancer. Um, I haven't, I've seen it with, I was going to say, I haven't seen like an accident. I haven't, I haven't personally like had a, you know, like a car accident or something like that. Most of the time when people become disabled, it is because of some kind of diagnosis or illness. It isn't because of injury, but both of those things happen. So either way, if for some reason you can't work, you're unable to work because of a, uh, 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 an illness or an injury, disability income insurance is one of the ways to mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one divorce mm -hmm. of marriages and in divorce. So divorce is a risk, you know, for if you're a couple in a marriage and you divorce, most of the time, what happens is your net worth is cut in half, right? Like one person takes half of the net worth. The other person takes the other half of the net worth. So for both parties, that is a significant loss of wealth and sometimes income, mm -hmm. um, unemployment, Right. So if we find ourselves by choice, by choice is my favorite, right? but if we find ourselves like, Hey, it's time to pivot, uh, you know, and I need a, I need to take a couple months or I need to take a year sabbatical in between. 
Um, or it's it's unexpected and unplanned, uh, but unemployment is a big risk. And then the last one is lawsuit. Um, and in business, you know, a lot of times we have business insurance that covers lawsuits, or we set up entities like LLCs or things like that that limit um, what how our how our personal wealth can be affected in in the case of a lawsuit. Uh, where I see people run into problems with their personal balance sheets are car accidents, um, dogs, like dog accidents or accidents with kids. So if you have kids or dogs, uh, especially if you have new drivers in your house, mm-hmm. critically important that you have good auto insurance, you have good homeowners insurance, and that you consider on top of both of those coverage, uh, an umbrella policy. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny one, my, just two, two quick stories to kind of build on what you just shared. When my kids were little, they played hockey and you can imagine, you know, sticks, my kids were goalies and, you know, not that they were fighters cause they were goalies, but if they shoot that puck and it hit someone in the head. So we had umbrella policies because ultimately we were responsible while they were minors. Right. Yeah. So God forbid a million times. So we, got the umbrella policy, which was, was really important. The other thing, because you don't know what the future holds when my kids were first born, we set up our will. So we chose who the guardian was and we got life insurance. My husband's five years younger than me. So I remember saying to him, listen, I know, like, I don't want kids. I don't want any more kids. And, but what if I die, you're five years younger than me, you marry a younger girl than you and they want a kid. I die that money is for my kids, not for you and the new chickadee and yeah. right. This new family. Not that I'd be, I, I wouldn't not want him to get married again, but that money is for my kids. So right. we, the attorney, we set up, it's an insurance trust. There's no money in the trust unless one of us dies and the money goes into the trust. Neither one, we did this for, I don't own his and he doesn't own mine. Meaning we don't get the benefit. We, we're not the beneficiary. The trust is. So ultimately I can, and, and my, my brother is the um, financier of it, if you will, the executor of it, so that if, God forbid, something happened, I could say, hey, listen, I want to take the kids to Disney so that I, if I got married, that I don't, my new husband says, I want to start a business. Let's take that money. No, no, no. Again, the money is for the kids. So there's so many, th- if you don't know this, though, you don't even know what to ask the attorney or the financial planner. And that's why people like you are necessary, because you understand that web of need to mitigate risk, because we don't know. And that's why it's a risk factor, because it's a blind spot. We don't know what the future is going to hold. Yes. Yes. And um, and it's okay that we don't know everything, right? It's, it's the same. It's why you go to, it's why you go to professionals. It's why you go to a doctor and like, I, you know, I have this pain and I don't know where it's coming from. And, you know, whatever the case is, there's a reason that they went to medical school and they understand the mechanics of our bodies better than we do. That's right. um, and same goes for, it's okay to not know all the risks, but what you do need to be really clear on is this is what I want to happen. And then you need to be engaging with a professional. This is what I want to happen. This is what I don't want to happen. And you need to be engaging with a professional that's going to help you understand and be confident in this is the recommendation that is going to help you achieve that thing. And if you can't, if they're not explaining it to you in a way that makes sense to you and set, and you can confidently say, okay, yes, that sounds like exactly what I'm trying to do and answer all of your questions to your satisfaction, and, you know, like you said earlier, Connie, like it's a different move to a different advisor. If you're asking them, what happens if my husband remarries? <laughs> Do my kids get this? If they cannot answer that to your satisfaction in a way that makes sense to you, then they're not done with the job. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I didn't know what a life insurance trust was when we, you know, my kids were little, I was still going for, I, I had finished my MBA at that point. So you know what it is, but until you know what it is for you, it's a very, it's knowing something, but knowing how to apply it in your life, two very different things. So yeah. when I asked that, he's younger than me, what if? And he said, you want to do a life insurance trust? I said, oh my gosh, and how would we set that up then? And, and right, and now you're having a conversation about how to set up that document. It's your voice from the grave, but it's your voice from the grave. So your family actually knows what you want to happen. We're yeah. out of time, Jen. This is, oh my God, there's like so many more questions that I feel like we should be talking about, but we're out of time. So 
I'm feeling another show in our future, girlfriends. If you're game, again, no pressure. I, I did not need to put you on the spot just then. <laughs> I'm no, I'm game. I, you know, I can cool. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And here's the deal. I, I think if you're listening and thinking, oh, that makes sense. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, I like her answer for that. And you're getting the vibe that Jen is the kind of person that you might need help with. Please reach out to her. Her email is jsapel at utorwealth.com. Website is utorwealth.com. And you have a gift for everybody. And I'll put that link in the show notes. It's a guide. What, what's in the guide so people, again, can get a flavor of who you are? Perfect. So the guide is actually a like how to find the right financial advisor for you. So like the customized, if you're shopping for an advisor, how do you find it? In the guide, there's kind of an intro to these are the different types of advisors that are out there and the kind of scope of work that they do. Um, And then I give you some tips as to like, these are the areas um, to consider. So like their style, are they more educational? Are they more authoritative? Um, And then there's like a a grid in the back so that as you're interviewing advisors, you can take notes so that you can compare a couple of advisors and say, okay, this is the right fit for me. You're not the right fit for me. And on my website, you mentioned the utorawealth.com. There's a book now button. I spend 20 minutes with anybody who has financial questions, whether or not it's called a fit call. So we may not, we may be, we may not be a good fit and that is okay. Um, especially for women, especially because of how I grew up and what ha- what my mom went through post-divorce. I open up my calendar for 20 minutes to anybody. If I'm not the right fit, I can at the very least say, this is the next direction for you. These are the things to consider. And it's so funny. And I wanted to say that before. And I, I went to another thought process. We're not the fit for everybody, Jen. And yeah. that's okay because- Money is our health, I think, is the most important thing, because if we're not healthy of mind, body, spirit, you're not going to be healthy and effective out in the world. So you can't support your family and all those things. So to me, that's the most important. Second, most important, you got to get in touch with the money. You got to tap into your beliefs. You got to have an agent like a Jen in your corner because you don't know what you don't know. That's why they're called blind spots, by the way. So somebody like you, but Somebody might meet you and think, yeah, you know, you don't make sense to me for whatever reason. It's not personal. It just is. I know my style. When I teach, I am not everybody's cup of tea. That's okay. You want to make sure you're finding someone that you can trust and that you feel comfortable with because this is personal. Money is personal. And we talk about this. What your goals in life are personal. You have to be able to trust that person. I think you're amazing. And I think everybody should schedule a 20 minutes with you, man. It, like to me, that's a no brainer. At least download the guide so that you could start to reflect on questions maybe you haven't thought to ask yourself, let alone a, a, an expert with when it comes to money. And for all of my young people listening, Jen might be a great resource for you as you start out. I know you don't have a ton of money, but it's worth having a conversation, maybe introduce your mom and dad so that as a family, you guys can plan, you know what your mom and dad want. God forbid something happens for them. This is a nice catalyst to start those conversations about the icky parts of life, like death and, and financial distress and stuff like that. So Jen, thank you so much. I, I think fun stuff too. I know we, well, that's what we have to do. There's a lot of fun stuff with money too, right? We, we can like manage the risk and then we can move to all the fun and sexy things. Maybe that's what <laughs> I'm like the cod is the doom and gloom, and then, but we could party too, right? Yeah, we could party too. I like I, it. Thanks, Jen. Thanks so much for adding that. Having me Thank, thanks for being on. Great show. Oh, so much, just really, really good information. Uh, really appreciate it, especially because you know I grew up in the industry. So when I find like-minded, just honest, in integrity trying to make a difference out there with something that's super important, like money. I just love spotlighting people like you. So again, another show is in our future. Yeah. Back at you, my friend. She just did, for those of you not listening, watching on YouTube, she did the little hard uh, things with her hands. So thank you for that. Back at you. And I hope you will join me weekly as we question, build and discover that change. Ah! 
isn't as bad as you think when you have experts like Jen and hopefully me um, having these conversations, shining lights on things that maybe you didn't know about and just helping you figure out what that next step in your trajectory of change, whatever that is for you. And I truly hope my guests and I provide some good insight and tips for you to execute. And Jen said it, I'm going to say it a little bit differently, but this is important. Information is a beautiful thing, but if you do nothing with it, if you have a plan, but you do nothing with it, it's simply information or a plan. Trust me, put that plan, put that information like we shared today into action. Do the worksheet that Jen is offering. I promise you magic happens on the back end. So again, Jen, thank you for being on. Thank you all for tuning in to Enlightenment of Change with me, your host, Connie Whitman on webtalkradio.com. I truly am honored to have you on your journey and this journey of change with me. And I am honored that I have amazing guests that can share some, hopefully some light and um, shine some clarity in whatever change you're going through. I love you all. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Have a great one, everybody.